readers, Lilu here. Hello you, this is a juicy friend here and we're surrounded by them. We're actually at Sarah McLean's home and she's gonna uh, welcome us. She's a wonderful spiritual teacher, a juicy meditation teacher actually that worked for many years with Deepak Chopra and that studied in a, an ashram, went all around the world and grew spiritually and now she's bringing all these teachings here in this beautiful part of the world. So I look forward to sharing with you all her teachings and we're going to go inside of her home. So come with me and... Creators, Lilu here in Sedona, Arizona on the GC Living Tour and I'm today with Sarah McLean. Hello. Hello. Thank welcome. You. Thank you for welcoming us in your home. You're welcome. My pleasure. There's such a special energy here, isn't there? <laughs> there is. <laughs> there a lot there is. is going on. There is a lot going on in here. When we built this house actually, you know, I lived in a Zen Buddhist monastery in a tiny room. I mean the size of what is now the size of my closet. And I used to have to walk about a half a mile to the bathroom. And I met Marty, who, my husband, who had a big, big home. And he, saw, he sold his last home to the Saudi Arabian royal family. This home is so big, I was very uncomfortable when we were building it. And I said, if we're building this home, let's make sure we build it so that we can have retreats here. Mm -hmm. We raise funds here for nonprofit organizations. We bring lots of groups in for poetry or musical evenings. But we do a lot of retreats right in this space. And you can feel it, right? Yeah, I can feel it, yeah. It, it's magnificent. You would see here the views on, on the red rocks and the environment here. It's very special. Thank you again for welcoming us. And for those of you that don't know Sarah, she's, uh, she, you lived for two years in a Zen Buddhist monastery. I did. Mm -hmm. And um, in an ashram in India. Mm -hmm. I did, in South India. And then worked for the, at the Chopra Center. I did. I was the education director for Deepak Chopra. Wow. Yep. And with Baron Katie and a lot of those amazing people doing great work out there. Mm -hmm. And you chose to settle here in Sedona. I did. I chose to live with my husband, who was already here. Oh. <laughs> so, Sedona is a very special place. You know, um, I, for those people who have never been, it is considered one of the most beautiful places in America, mm. and it is a very inward place. You know, they they often compare it to Aspen, Colorado, because of the lifestyle and things. But the actuality is, when people come here, they spend a lot of time going inward. They spend a lot of time really doing some self-examination and and supporting their own spiritual evolution here and there's plenty of there are plenty of tools for that whether it's being outside in nature in the red rocks or meditating in at the buddhist stupa or going to a a conference you know um, some sort of enlightenment conference and there are plenty of those to go around we have amazing amazing teachers here in sedona as well as um, really really amazing musicians and poets and authors for some reason, Sedona attracts people that want to cultivate their creativity mm -hmm. and their passion. Mm -hmm. You've probably noticed that. <clears throat> I love it. I've met so many juicy people here. So why did, you, why did you choose to go through this path? Why did you go to a monastery and an ashram and now into meditation? What, was, what is your journey? Well, I was originally, as a young woman in my early 20s or mid-20s, I had been around the world already on my bicycle. I was always searching for something and I didn't know what. I ended up getting very um, interested in developing homes and, and brownstones in Washington, D.C. And I, by the time I was about 26, I, I had everything really that I wanted and I, I was not happy. Mm -hmm. And I was a young age to not be happy. But I really felt that there was something I was missing in my life. And I read this book review um, in, a mag in a newspaper on a Sunday, and it was talking about this book called Perfect Health. It was by Deepak Chopra, who at the time was not famous. But what I loved about this review was it was talking about these natural approaches to healing. And this was in the late 80s. This was like 1989. Maybe it was even the book Quantum Healing. But it was all about holistic thinking. Um, mm. 
create the mind-body connection, things that were not necessarily in the in vogue yeah. at the time. So I got so excited, I said, I dropped everything, and I said, I'm going to go work for Deepak Chopra. I left my home, I had a 14-room house, I left my job, I volunteered, I went and moved into the Ayurveda Center in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and I volunteered my time for a couple of years. And ended up, he ended up moving to California, and I did. And you ask about meditation, the primary approach to healing through this Ayurveda, which is translated as the science of life and longevity, is through awareness, is through consciousness, and it's through becoming aware of the body's, the body's responses, whether it's a yum or a yuck or a yes or a no, or whether it's nourishing or toxic. So the first approach to healing is to become aware, self-aware. So everybody who came into the center would have to learn to meditate. And I mean, I'm talking everybody, whether they were Barbara Streisand or George Harrison or the, Sam Walton or the person who was recovering from cancer or a person who was recovering from or trying to face multiple sclerosis or depression or drug addiction. Whoever came into the center, the first thing they would do is learn to meditate. Now, as I said, my first love was the whole mind-body approach and the natural approach with herbs and taste th therapy and color therapy and aromatherapy and sound therapy and yoga and massage. But I quickly learned that meditation was the most powerful. So I got really involved in that. I spent, like I say, eight years working with uh, Deepak, whether it was in Massachusetts or when he came out to California. Mm. And <clears throat> I ended up spending, I decided I wanted to find out the real roots of meditation. So one day, uh, Deepak's daughter was getting married, Malika, and she was getting married in India. And yes, I had some vacation time coming to me, but I thought, mm -hmm. I can't go to India and come back in a week. It's mm -mm. crazy. If I'm going to India, I'm going for a lot longer. So um, one day, relatively soon thereafter, I said, you know, I think I'm done here with setting up these programs and helping him. And so I took off and I went to India. And I wanted to really uh, access the roots of meditation, the, the, the true, authentic meditation. Mm -hmm. So I lived in an ashram in India. I spent a lot of time learning about the different yogas, whether it's bhakti yoga or karma yoga or yana yoga or um, what's the other one? Raja yoga, which includes meditation and, and all of the practices. And I spent six months with a woman named Amachi. I don't know if you know her, Mata Amritananda Mai. She goes around the world hugging people. Oh, yeah, Amma. The hugging saint. Oh, yes. I lived with her. Actually, I was six months in India, probably closer to five months at her ashram. Wow. And I got to understand that whole lifestyle around living with devotion, because she's more of a bhakti yogi. Living with devotion, living with meditation, making that the center of, of life. Again, which it always should be, but it, I had to relearn that and that lifestyle. I ended up going up to Dharamsala, which is in North India, after about five months and spending some time with the Dalai Lama and his teachers. Mm. And that's a whole nother approach to uh, meditation. That's the Tibetan Buddhist approach, which, you know, Buddhism traveled from Nepal to India to Tibet over to Sri Lanka to China to Japan. It went all over the world, Southeast Asia. And this, Tibet, this Tibetan Buddhism is a particular flavor. So I spent a lot of time studying that. I actually ended up being a teacher for some of the nuns that work with the Dalai Lama to teach them English. So I spent about a month there doing that. And then I came back after my visa expired. I came back to the US and I had to really refocus here because I had been on a roll for eight years with eight this. Eight years. Yeah, and I said, what am I going to do here? And it was very challenging to re-enter mm -hmm. the United States to find my passion again. And so I, I actually decided to go into a Zen Buddhist training center, a monastery in the US. In the US. Mm -hmm. And it was opened by, um, I'm not sure when they came, but there were a couple of um, Roshis that came from Japan. Suzuki Roshi, who you might have heard of, he's up in, um, he went to Northern California. and then. Uh, Mazumi Roshi, he went to Southern California in Los Angeles, and I went to a little summer ashram, of, I mean summer monastery of his outside of LA. It's called Zen Mountain Center, and now it's called Yokoji Zen Mountain Center, and I spent two years there as, again, immersed in 
meditation, immersed in that lifestyle, immersed in the community, immersed in what they call, you know, the Dharma, the, the Dharma, which is the knowledge, and working there. And really, I love that. I was so supportive of my own personal deepening of meditation, understanding the roots of meditation. So when I came out of all of that, actually I got a call there after a couple of years from Gary Zukov, who said, mm -hmm. I'm on Oprah every week, I need some help, mm -hmm. I've heard you've helped Gary, I mean D Deepak, I've heard you help Debbie Ford, will you help me to navigate this world of popularity? And he had so much to share with the world, but didn't have a vehicle for which to share it, so I started working with him for a while. I learned a lot from him and working there too. But after I moved to um, Arizona, I met my husband while I was working a couple years later for Byron Katie. And I came here and I said, you know, n people don't have the time or the money to travel to India to find the roots of meditation mm -hmm. or to spend two years in a monastery or to spend time up with the Dalai Lama. So I'm going to really figure out what was essential for my uh, meditation practice and, and what really helped me, the keys for unlocking the practice. So I just decided to start teaching here, which it's a natural, you know, people come to Sedona and, you know, some people choose to go on a Jeep tour or a hot air balloon ride, but those people that come here seriously seeking spirituality, you know, I really want to offer them something very real. Mm. How was the, the, the learning curve? Because you went through eight years, so I guess there was some moments of real challenge where you just wanted to stop? Yes. Well, what I realized was I first learned to meditate in 1989, right after I read that book, the book review, before I even actually worked for Deepak. So I've been meditating since 1989. Um, by the time 1980, uh, what was it, 1997 rolled around, I was in India. So I had been meditating for about eight years. But when I first learned to meditate, um, some of my challenges were the expectations that I had about meditation, that I was supposed to quiet my mind by thinking about it. I was supposed to have a certain experience in meditation that seemed out of reach for me. I was supposed to have a certain feeling in meditation that I didn't feel. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to feel a spiritual connection and that was um, sort of elusive to me. So what I realized was I was under the wrong impression about what meditation was. Mm -hmm. You know, meditation is re really a practice. It really is a daily practice. And it's a practice of turning the attention inward so we can transcend or go beyond the activity of the mind mm -hmm. to have the direct experience of our own awareness. Mm -hmm. So for those people who are listening at the, to this interview, you know, turn your attention to that presence that's behind your eyes, you know, to that presence that we call Lilu or Sarah or you. You know, turn your attention to that presence and you'll discover this sort of timeless, subtle, powerful part of yourself that's untouchable in terms of age and space and time, but it is very powerful. And so meditation helps us to reconnect with and live from that essence, that presence. Some people call it your consciousness or your soul or your re the real you or the Atman or the self with a capital S. I mean, there's so many um, words for it. And I didn't understand meditation as that. I didn't understand that it was really um, about enlivening that presence within us. You know, I had come to it and had heard about people coming to meditation to relieve stress. Mm -hmm or to discover a better life, or to get what they want. That's a big thing with the secret, you know. Mm -hmm. And or to um, feel more connected to their loved one. Mm -hmm. But with meditation for me, it helped me to get more connected with who I am and what I want. Which, you know, that's a question for everybody is, in Zen they have us do these koan practices, which are questions that sort of stump the mind. One that maybe the viewers have heard of is, you know, what's the sound of one hand clapping? Uh -huh. Well, one koan for me is, who am I? Yeah. You know, because the answer changes depending on the day, and none of the answers are correct yeah. in entirety. Mm -hmm. You know, so for meditation for me is a real practice, and it's different all the time. And when I enter meditation with a couple of different attitudes, the first attitude is to have 
an attitude of beginner's mind, to not have an expectation that I'm going to see white light, yeah. or I'm going to feel God, or I'm going to know my past lives, or I'm going to experience my chakras, or I'm going to have a great time. I mean, sometimes meditation is not that fun. You know, it's really, it's not always fun. Sometimes it's boring. Sometimes it's like brushing your teeth, you know? You and that's that part that I wanted to talk with you about, to see really where were the, the, the big challenges for you on this path. Because I think we all encounter some roadblocks and then we stop meditation, we stop the practice yeah. or we stop the journey. Yet you continued and you went on for eight years and now you're here and mm -hmm. continuing this. So mm -hmm. I'm really interested in hearing from you where, where was those big challenges that came up and what was it like and how did you shift that? Right. Well, the biggest challenge is definitely for most people and for me is just about doing it. <laughs> time. Yeah. Putting, out the, putting aside the time. time because we're so focused externally that we're always trying to navigate this world of emails and computers and jobs and relationships. And so those seem to take precedence over yeah. taking care of ourselves. So, so something is more important than right. that. So we have to make it a priority. For me, I'm fortunate that it is my priority. My personal spiritual growth has always been a priority for me from that moment, uh, even before I read that newspaper article, but it has to be a priority. And you know, you can think about it as uh, what they say on the airlines. They say, put your oxygen mask on first before you try to save everyone else in case of emergency. Yeah. Meditation is like that, is to uh -huh. create that that um, nourishment inside before we try to take care of everyone and everything else. So time is first. We have to make it a priority. The second thing is people have too many expectations about the experiences that they're going to have in meditation and they often feel like they're doing it wrong. I, had, I led a meditation this morning and a woman was in there and I said, well, who doesn't meditate or who can't? And two people raised their hand. I said, well, what's the matter? And they said, well, I think I'm doing it wrong. Uh. And I can tell you that you can't really do it wrong unless you do a few things. If you try too hard, it's going to do it. You're going to be operating from the level of thought. Because yeah. you can't try to quiet the mind. Yeah. It doesn't work. Mm. Trying is, is a thought pattern. So trying too hard, being unkind to yourself. That's another reason people quit meditation, because they expect something from themselves and they're not nice to themselves. Just like uh, in our culture, people are mean to themselves to get themselves, to sort of like uh, to motivate themselves. Mm -hmm. Meditation is opposite. We have to be kind to ourselves. And they also quit because they think they're having too many thoughts. You know, and thoughts are always going to be a part of meditation. It's been referred to as monkey mind. Mm. You know, we're trained our, our brain and our awareness is trained to think about, well, what is it, one thought every two seconds about the past or the future. Rarely are we in the present moment with our awareness. So meditation can be a frustration or an exercise in frustration if we think we're supposed to have a certain experience, mm -hmm. if we think we're supposed to stop thinking, mm -hmm. if we feel restless and bored. You know, people stop for all different reasons. They, they don't notice the measurable differences because sometimes they're subtle. Mm -hmm. Sometimes w after we meditate, you know, the benefits are seen in our lives. Are you happier? Do you feel better in your skin? Do you feel juicy? You know, meditation actually makes you juicy. It increases your DHEA levels, which are your youth hormone. It's your youth hormone. It changes the way your skin feels. It's almost, it changes the circulation in the body because normally we're walking through the world in a sort of fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. You know, the sympath sympathetic nervous system is activated. That's the nervous system that uh, is, is dealing with things on a physical level. It's all about time and space and where things are and how fast we need to get them done. And we're triggered by external circumstances. But when we meditate, we sort of re-enliven the parasympathetic nervous system, the restful awareness response where our blood pressure is reduced our circulation is normalized. Our blood moves away from, um, in, the par in the sympathetic, it moves into the heart and lungs so it can get reoxygenated so we can fight or flee. When we meditate, the blood circulation normalizes. Our digestion's improved. Our fertility, if we're having, trying to have children, is improved. Uh, hormonally, we're improved. 
our skin resistance changes, our respiration ra rate changes. We actually get rid of the lactic acid. We change the function and the actual structure of yeah, the brain. Yeah, new pathways, oh, I heard. Yeah, neuroplasticity. They're finding now that when we meditate over and over, we start to activate the happy part of the brain. Mm -hmm. We start to activate the compassionate part of the brain. And we deactivate the amygdala, which is the fight or flight center. Mm. And we activate the hippocampus, which are the sort of kidney shaped parts of the brain that are improving focus and memory. And so we actually can change the brain's structure and use more of the brain when we meditate. So there's so many reasons to meditate, but people say, well, I didn't see the white light or mm. I didn't have that you know, experience you had. So we always want to approach meditation with an, a beginner's mind, not what I call an I know mind. Like I know what's supposed to happen and I know I'm supposed to have this. No, every meditation is new, just like every moment is new. So when we start to meditate with that beginner's mind, ha sitting down with an intention to meditate, uh, with the Chopra Center they say, because one of the obstacles is time, they say RPM, rise, P, meditate. <laughs> Get up, go to the bathroom, and sit back down and meditate before you walk your dogs, before you feed the kids, before you talk to the husband, or answer the phone, or check the email, or pick up the Blackberry or the iPhone. Yeah. Stop and meditate, even if it's for five minutes. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing. And then one of the other obstacles, I think, is that when people meditate, they come out of it too quickly. Okay, they... they or not for the right reason. Yeah, or they just think, okay, I'm done. Yeah. Or, yeah. Oh, I have really something urgent now to do. <laughs> right. And you it's know, time. <laughs> exactly. And you know what that is? Uh -uh. When the mind settles down in meditation and the body settles down in meditation, like we talked about, that starts to happen. We actually change our brain, uh, the, the brain waves from the beta state, the active state, to a more alpha, theta, or delta state in meditation. We go into more of a restful state. It can be compared in some cases, depending on the meditation you do, to sleep in the way that you start to disconnect your sense from your senses, from mm -hmm. the sensory input. I mean, have you ever meditated when you lose track of everything, time and space and your own body? Mm -hmm. So that's a yeah. lot like sleep. That's the only other time it happens. But the difference in meditation is you're alert. Yeah. You know, because then we go into out-of-body experiences, too. Is that part of meditation? It can happen, but what Deepak Chopra says is the real challenge is to have an in-body experience. Yeah. To feel how you feel in your body all the time. Yeah. The body is always in the present moment. The, the breath is always in the present moment. So when we meditate, we actually start to create a more of a mind-body connection. Mm -hmm. Now, we, oftentimes people just are not aware of their bodies and have an out-of-body experience. Yeah, and it seems like it's another mechanism of the brain or something. We, we get out of the body, but really, yeah, I can see how... Yeah, the trick is to get into to get the body, into to get more connected. Yeah, and, 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 and it opens the heart. Yes. Like, we're talking about the brain right now, but there's something with this opening of the heart. I know you're in the movie, The Sacred Journey of the Heart. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us this, um, the, the, what the role of the heart is in, all, in the meditation or... Well, for me, that's part of my journey, too, is I'm really, I was really stimulated by Deepak Chopra's book, and I understood intellectually everything yeah. in that book. Wow, and because, that's... that's a <laughs> well, you know why? I had to listen to, for eight years, listen to all of his presentations and his interviews and read all his books, so I was yeah. very, very, I almost could mimic, you know, some of the jokes and the things he would say, but the actual practice mm -hmm. of some of these things is much harder than the, the knowledge. So putting that pedal to the metal, putting, you know, putting that knowledge into practice. And one of them is this journey from living up here and mm -hmm. thinking about what you feel mm -hmm. to moving down here and actually feeling what we feel. Yeah. And that was my biggest journey. And I actually, as a part of working with Deepak, I ended up with cancer in the junction point between the heart and the head. And I had to take a look, because I was really interested in this, I had to take a look at, well, what is this? What is this on a, a spiritual level? What is this on an etheric level or energetic level? Mm. And I found what it was, is I had all these feelings, 
but I never express them for whatever reason. We don't have to go into that, but a lot of us have it, whether it's culturally or f a familial issue or just because we don't trust ourselves. And meditation was a journey of becoming, becoming really uh, trusting and having a lot of faith, both in my body, in my feelings, in what I was feeling in a certain situation, in my own intuition, and in my own uh, passion and expression of myself. So it's one of the things that I had to learn. Mm -hmm. And the heart is much more powerful electrically and magnetically than the brain. And, you know, Greg Braden can explain it much better than I can. He was in that movie, too, and he's brilliant about the coherence of the heart. But one of the things that happens in meditation is a coherence between the brain waves mm -hmm. and the heart and the whole mind-body connection. And the heart is really where we are. I mean, if, if I say to you, where are you? You're probably going to take your hand and mm -hmm. point it right here. Mm -hmm. This is where we are. You know, it is a journey to living here. There are people who say, um, and it's part of my journey too, there are people who say, I don't know how to feel. Well, you don't have to know <laughs> how to feel. All we have to do is feel how to feel. We feel our feelings. That's it. It's not a, we don't have to involve the brain. And I think that's something that's happening now more than ever, people understanding that that's its own language, the, f the emotional fluency. And awareness is a big part of that, which is what happens in meditation. Yeah, and there is a, really a real wisdom that lies here, and we have to disconnect this part, and meditation helps us disconnect this part to connect to this one, so that this yeah. wisdom and this energy can connect to the, real, to the real wisdom. Right. I mean, this is where the ancient texts say that this is where we actually are. This yeah. is where we actually live. This is a vehicle. The mind is, or the brain is like a, an amazing friend. But it's not who we are. Mm -hmm. You know, we are a soul. We are a spirit that's embodying uh, this. And, you know, we're going to, we have to connect to that and make that more dominant yeah. than the intellect. Because the heart is wise. The heart is, you know, it's, it's uh, powerful and wise and ever-present. And that's, you know, we can learn a lot from our own heart, from our own breath. Mm. And then our essence can speak out and be, be there. Our spirit is, is free then, huh? Yes, but I think what it requires, and this again is what I've learned through meditation, is to be a good listener. Yeah. You know, people ask all the time, and uh, Yogi Bhajan said in a quote, he said, he was the founder of uh, Kundalini Yoga, and he said, you know, prayer is talking to God and meditation is listening. And of course, I love him and I believed that, but it's not necessarily true for me. Mm -hmm. Um, what's true for me is prayer is talking to God, and I didn't even believe in God when I was starting to meditate. And then meditation is about purifying the nervous system, purifying and refining the senses so that we can go to more and more subtle aspects of ourselves. So when we're, we're done through the, after the meditation, we can walk through the world and we can hear God. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. That, and that's the quiet whisper, yeah. that steady intuition, the wisdom of the body, yeah. the presence that we can establish with meditation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a practice that we can bring every day in every moment of our life, talking, walking. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that, how you practice it every day in every moment in your own life? Well, I wish it were every, it was every moment, but I can tell you that... As um, often as... <laughs> until I remember again. <laughs> yeah. But that's maybe what Yogi Bhajan was saying, is that you know, meditation is listening, and, and maybe that's the meditation of walking through the world. And I have to say, that's probably the macrocosm of it. And yes, ultimately, and a lot of spiritual teachers, Osho, have said, you know, meditation is what we do in our lives. And it should be that way, but it's not necessarily. It wasn't for me. I was a human doing, not a human being. Yeah. I was working very hard, and I had great intentions, and I was a nice person. But I had to learn to reconnect to my essence. And so every day, you know, there are, there are sitting practices, like sitting and paying attention to the breath, or using a mantra, or, and then there are moving practices, whether it's doing a walking meditation as we did in the monastery called Kinhin, or whether it's um, washing your hands, or taking a shower, or doing yoga, or Tai Chi. You know, there are moving meditations, 
there are sitting meditations, but then there's meditation as a way of walking through the world. Yeah. You know, uh, what is the Bhagavad Gita has this this particular phrase that says, Yogasta Karu Karmani, which means established in being, established in our own presence, perform action. So that's that's the goal of yoga, yeah. is to have our presence be with us all the time. So there are practices like bringing your attention to the present moment. And you can use cues like the phone ringing. When the phone rings, what, what is it? Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh would say, take a couple of deep breaths, bless the person on the phone, connect with your own heart before you answer the phone. Sometimes it can be as you're getting in your car and you sit in your car, turn your attention, scan your body, pay attention to your breath, and then go on to your car ride. I mean, there can be transition periods, whether it be as you first get up in the morning or when you're sitting down to a meal. One way to, ver to practice being very present mm -hmm. is through eating meditations and to be blessing the food, bringing to your awareness the elements that have been in, you know, in uh, coherence in the food or wherever the food came from. Think about who grew it and and the, the offering of nature itself, you know, and then to be very present with the aspect of seeing and smelling and hearing and eating and tasting the food. And you can do that in any practice. You know, that's what Tantra is, with the practice of making love. You know, it's about being present with the other person, being connected with the, the senses. Now, the senses can be used in meditation but ultimately, you know, you can use the sense of sight, the sense of, the sense of touch, mm -hmm. or the sense of sound in meditation. We can enliven the sense of taste through eating meditations, and the sense of smell tends to set us up for a, a mood or an emotion or experience. But with meditation, it's either sight, imagining something in the mind's eye, or staring at a candle flame, or, mm. you know, in the fireplace. I think the original meditations were probably staring at the stars or staring at a fire or paying attention to the breath. You know, we went to Italy lately, uh, recently, and we heard about Francis of Assisi. We went to Assisi. And here was this man. He was very wealthy. He was hanging out with his friends. He was a young man. And uh, he ended up going to jail for something he didn't do, which is like going, you know, if you think about it, it's like, being in the army or being in a monastery, it's a very regimented lifestyle, you know, and the mind can be trained in these places. And he came out of there and he went back to hang out with his friends, but he, had, he was a changed man. And one day he was looking up and he looked at the sky and he saw the stars and he had an awakening. So, you know, these are the basic ways we can have it, but it's not always that way. So sometimes we have to practice settling down the, the nervous system as it was imposed on him in jail. Mm. But um, basically... Or Nelson Mandela. There you go. Yeah. A lot of people... You know, I was in the military as a very young girl. What didn't you not do? <laughs> I, well, I have a few things. I haven't killed anybody, as far as I know. Um, but no, I, I feel like um, I've had a lot of experiences. It's been a juicy life so far. Yeah. And I have another 50 years to go, hopefully. Mm. But... Um, Basically, with what were we talking about? The well, with the, the be really being in the moment, in present, the present moment. See, I'm so in the moment I the, don't remember. But gratitude, <laughs> gratitude is really what seems to open up quite a lot to be in the present moment. You know what it, one person said, and I can't remember who it was, but maybe it'll come to me. If we just make thank you our mantra, yeah. if we walk through the world with a welcoming attitude towards everything, every experience, and welcoming it. We don't have to stay in a toxic experience, but if we just welcomed it and moved on, and pay attention to where the body wants to go. But just being in that welcoming, honoring experience. I mean, when I lived in India with that hugging saint, she would, I mean, living things were one thing, but she would bow down to a book or bow down to a to a rock or mm. bow down to, you know, inanimate objects because consciousness or awareness is not just in you and in me. It's in this plant. It's in this table. All the elements come together to create 
this intelligence to form this world. Greg Braden was talking about that the other night. He talked about this creative intelligence that they're looking for the God principle in this, in this big accelerator between Switzerland and France, they're, mm -hmm. the God the uh, particle. particle. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I don't think they're going to find it because Einstein was looking for it too. Mm -hmm. Where is that intelligence that underlies everything in creation? And maybe it's not something we can see or smell or taste or touch or hear. And so, you know, looking for something in creation may not be in form. You know, and that's what helps with meditation is we realize that what we see and smell and taste and touch and hear is not all there is. Mm -hmm. We can't see gravity. We can't see electricity. We can't see magnetism. But all three of those are essential for our lives. But we cannot touch them. We only can have the experience of, of their... We can only experience them in certain ways. If we capture electricity, we can turn on a light. If we have magnets, we can feel the magnetism. If we drop something, we experience gravity. But we can't point to it. And that's what happens when we try to point to our own presence. Mm -hmm. We can't find it by pointing to it. Mm -hmm. We can experience it. You know when someone's present with you, mm -hmm. right? You know when that's happening. We are right now. We are right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when people are present, that's, that's something we can experience, but we can't, I, if I opened up your brain or you opened up mine looking for me, <laughs> might not find it. So that's what happens with meditation is, is we start to navigate the more subtle realms of existence mm -hmm. that are beyond our instruments of perception. And you know what Aldous Huxley said, experiencing the infinite through the cleansed doors of perception. And meditation does that. That's why I say mm. meditation is about purifying the nervous system. And when we have a lot of thoughts in meditation, it's really just a purification process. So we, if we just n stop judging it and just mm -hmm. going back to our focus and not trying to stop the thoughts, we get to a more settled experience of ourselves. And we get to really experience our own presence, which is how we can walk through the world. Which is living a juicy life. It is. What is living a juicy life for you? Living a juicy life is, you know, I wish that uh, this man, this Viet Vietnamese monk, Thich Nhat Hanh, I believe his book is called Savor. And living a juicy life is about savoring everything. And we can't savor a meal or a love or a beautiful flower or a breeze unless we're fully present for it. We can't savor it. Have you ever sat down to eat and you've been hanging out with someone, you look down and the food's gone? <laughs> I mean, you know you ate it and it was probably good, but we missed it. Mm -hmm. We can miss so many juicy moments. Mm. So bringing our attention into the present moment, bringing our awareness into the present moment, we can savor mm -hmm. the moment. And we find that we've been trained out of that habit. So meditation is really just a training on so many levels, but one of the training is to bring us here, right now, mm -hmm. where your life is. Mm -hmm. You know, this is where the action is. This is where the magic is. This is where the magic is. Yeah. Mm. So that's it. Wonderful. So. And, and so you bring people here uh, in this amazing house um, for, for some retreats and some s workshops, or what's, what's, what's happening in your current, I mean, how can people connect with what you're doing and how can we participate and be part of it and well, get all this juiciness. <laughs> yeah, well, we are all connected when we're meditating. <laughs> yeah. But what I do with this, in this space here, um, we do a lot of retreats. Not yeah. a lot. I actually have to say we do a few retreats a year. And we have a, um, some group meditations and maybe some musical evenings that include meditation. Um, I teach, and you haven't been down there, but I have a little meditation studio. And it's a very sweet in there. And it's usually private or semi-private uh, programs. Mm -hmm. I do uh, go to other places when I'm invited to teach, whether it be a room full of 30 people or 300 people, I'll come and teach meditation. And, you know, I teach for a lot of corporations and I teach uh, religious groups and spiritual groups and study groups. So people can contact me, they can go on my website. There are a couple of free meditations there. Um, it's SedonaMeditation.com. I also lead creativity retreats because one of the things that happens when we start to meditate, it happened for me, is I start to access my authentic voice, mm -hmm. my creative voice. I was afraid to speak in public. 
Mm. See what happens when you have surgery here. It opens up a big can of worms. Wow. So I, um, you know, basically now speak anywhere and speak in public. And, and so if you go on my website, there's a list of the different places that, you know, I'll be. Um, I do creativity retreats. I do women's retreats, uh, meditation and yoga retreats. There's a wonderful one coming in October. There's a wonderful one coming here in, in Sedona. It is. And you know, as I said, meditation helps you to be a good listener. Mm -hmm. I woke up one day and I said, and I thought I'd never do this again because I was always putting on events for all of these people I worked for and myself. And I said, I have to put on a women's event. Mm -hmm. It has to be to support women's waking, awakening, a women's spirituality. Women are waking up to their power and to their creativity and to their own voice. And so I decided, you know, after sitting many years in the audiences of these men, I decided it's time to sit in the audiences of powerful women. So it's called Woman Arising, W-O-M-A-N, not women, but Woman Arising. And it's here in Sedona at one of the most magical places called Enchantment Resort. Mm. It's very beautiful. I have a beautiful spa. They have a crystal meditation room. Oh, wow. It's really beautiful. And so I'm bringing about six or eight women to speak and to share their awakening. Mm -hmm. uh, what brought them to, what was the challenge in their life? How did they wake up? And what is their theory? Because we all have different credos that we live by. You know, we all have a different awakening experience. And so I'm, I'm bringing in Clarissa Pinkola Estes, who wrote the book, Women Who Run With The Wolves, who she changed many women's lives, probably in the 80s here in America. And uh, also Lindsay Wagner, who is known as the Bionic Woman, who's had her own spiritual journey and now leads a meditation retreat as part of the weekend. Mm. And a number of other wonderful women, Colette Baron reed who uh, is coming out with a new book called The Map, which is about how to really honor your own story. You know, I've done amazing things, and I, I honor my story, and I'm sure you have done amazing things. And many people have, and sometimes the stories are about navigating the world of motherhood. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it's about finding our way with it, finding our passion in our lives. And sometimes it means, like for me, going around the world, finding the keys to, to bringing meditation to you so you don't have to go to India for six months, although it's fun, mm -hmm. or you don't have to live in a monastery. So everybody's got something yummy in their life or juicy. So we have to find that and honor that instead of what we tend to do, which is be so hard on ourselves. Yeah. Let's, let's talk for one second to, about the powerful woman. How do you define a powerful woman? I, well, in my own personal experience, I, I think a woman who is authentic, who says what she means and means what she says, a woman who is what I call soul-centered, which means uh, living from that essence, from that presence. And it's, it's not, not living by determining how everybody's feeling about her, being codependent on what other people's opinions are, but having the courage to follow that intuitive, small, but powerful voice inside, just to live by that as the navigator. Living in authentically, living soul-centeredly, and I don't know, to just probably to eliminate the stress from their nervous system so that they see life more as happening for them than happening to them. Because what happens when we've accumulated a lot of stress in our nervous system is we don't always uh, take responsibility for it. We think <laughs> somebody's creating it for us. So I think a powerful woman takes responsibility for her own self-care, learning to love herself, honor herself, and, and to do stress reduction programs, whether it's a walk in the woods or spending time with their dog or you know, playing music or doing art, whatever cultivates that stress reduction in the body, meditating, yeah. obviously. I mean, that just goes without saying. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the definition has changed. Which one? Of a powerful woman. It seems for like me. Uh, for, for, for all of us, like we really as women, it's time for us to set into our authentic self, embrace our intuition, you know, and let our, let, uh, let's, let's shine without that power 
I think I think there's been a disimbalance yeah. in between the masculine and feminine energy in a lot of women that have achieved great things. Right. But it's a matter of letting that nurturing part of ourselves shine right. out. We have a different way of walking through the world. Um, you know, but we've learned to be competitive. Women yeah. are very competitive. And so we have to move more into the cooperation. Mm. And also, you know, Gary Zukov talked about this, this authentic power. Mm -hmm. That power from within rather than by, based on titles or mm -hmm. relationships or roles or responsibilities or money in the bank. Mm -hmm. It's this authentic confidence. You know, confidence means to walk with truth, confidelity, you know, truth. And so w we have to walk with our truth. And we don't have to be louder. We don't have to be a brutal or aggressive. But there's nothing wrong with being confident. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's where, you know, it's, it's a new thing for me. I never was, I wasn't a woman's rights person either. I wasn't into God or women or anything. I was really just into moving out of the suffering of life because life wasn't so pleasant for me. Yeah. So that was my motivation, but it, it led me to, um, to this really magical world. Mm. And not just in space and time, but just a, in experience. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. You're Thank welcome. Thank you for this wonderful meditative interview. Was it? <laughs> yes. Good. Thanks for being so juicy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And if you want to see more interviews, please visit JuicyLivingTour.com. Much love, my beautiful co-creators. Much love. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.